Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. We're super excited to have you on. We have two great speakers today, and we have a ton to get through, so we're really excited. Um, we're going to give folks a few more minutes to just hop on, and we'll get started here. So while we're waiting, I want to make sure everyone can use the question box feature in this webinar app. So if you guys could all type in, you know, where you're from, I'd love to hear, you know, see all the different people that we have here today, all the different people coming from all different areas of the of the world. Let's see who's on, where they're coming from. Definitely feel free to drop into the question box where you're from. I'd love to hear it. I'm calling out of Boston today. Um, it's getting quite hot around here. It was 90 degrees last weekend, 90 degrees the past few weekends, and I am melting. So i um, hoping some folks don't have to deal with that heat. Let's see, we got Wyatt from Southwest Florida. We got Jay from Georgia. Tara from Texas. Wow, we have a ton of people. Cape Cod, love to see that. New Hampshire, I'm originally from New Hampshire. That's awesome to see. Michigan, we have, oh my gosh, these are flowing in. This is awesome. Other folks from Boston, that's great. Of course, we have some folks from Canada as well. Welcome. We have some folks from Tennessee. Holy smokes, they're just pouring in. This is awesome, you guys. Thanks for jumping on and sharing where you're from. It's truly an amazing experience that we can speak to you all in a personal setting like this on these webinars, um, all virtually. So that's great. We got Tracy from Texas. We got Justin from Ohio, Vicki from Arizona, Hannah from Nebraska. Seriously, everyone and anyone on here today is from all different corners of the world. This is super exciting. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, with that, I'm great. I'm really happy to see that everyone is able to comfortably use the question box. Definitely feel free to drop in your questions. I'll be sure to remind you of that throughout the webinar because we'll have a Q&A session at the end. With that being said, it looks like most of our folks have hopped on, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in. So um, quick housekeeping notes and logistics. This webinar will be recorded, okay? So don't worry about taking notes or anything like that. You'll get the materials in your inbox later on today. Um, and the web, the recording will also be easily found on our YouTube channel. So definitely check out our YouTube. The Local IQ and the WordStream YouTubes both have the webinar recordings, webinar recordings from past webinars. So you'll be able to easily access this later. So definitely don't worry about that. It will be recorded. Um, also, again, don't forget to submit those questions. I'll be monitoring the question box throughout while Jenna and Erin are speaking. And then we'll have a great Q&A session at the end. The last few sessions we've had have been super in-depth, so I'm really excited for that. So a little bit about Local IQ. So some of you might already be familiar with the Local IQ platform. Some of you might be working with our sister brands, Reach Local and WordStream. Some of you might be totally new to us, and that's great. We welcome everyone at every stage of their marketing here. But just to get everyone up to speed on who, who Local IQ truly is, we're an all-in-one marketing platform that helps small businesses, growing businesses, find, convert, and keep customers. So we marry proprietary marketing technology, free tools, and, expert, and expertise to really make sure that you maximize your results across your marketing channels. So that's a little bit about us. If you're looking to learn more about us, this is something that has come up a lot in past webinars is where you can find us online. Definitely check out the Local IQ and WordStream blogs. We cover a lot of these topics that we talk about in these webinars in depth on there. Um, you can also follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We share updates on upcoming webinars. We share updates on new data that we've released or any sorts of studies and things like that. So definitely check us out. You'll find a lot of more in-depth information on there. Great. So a little bit about me, your facilitator today. It's wonderful again to meet you all virtually. My name is Susie. I'm a content marketing specialist over at Local IQ, where I write educational content on everything under the marketing sun. Um, I previously was on the WordStream side working with clients um, day in, day out. So I took that experience and applied it to the educational content we write today. I'm based out of Boston, like I said, and normally I talk about how much I love the winter but that season has been well past us with these 90 degree weekends. So I've definitely been hitting the beach uh, to beat the heat. And with that, I'll pass it on to our great presenters today. Hi, everybody. I'm Erin Rose. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I've been in the digital marketing space for 16 years. 
um, and, and beyond. And I've gotten to work with a, a bunch of leading organizations and a bunch of organizations smaller than that. Uh, I think that I've worn every hat that you probably can in this space, right? So I've been on the sales side, I've been on the service side, I've been on the web dev side, design, analytics, enablement. I currently run the partner channel for local IQ, so people who resell our services. And uh, if we're doing fun facts, um, I am on a, mis on a mission to visit 100 beaches. So I'm from a waterless small town, um, and I have a whole collection with jars, and I just got back from Chile, which was beach number 69. Hi everyone, my name is Jenna, excited to be joining with Local IQ today. Um, I am an agency partner development manager here at Google and prior to this, I was a top account strategist, so I worked with some of the top accounts through our agency partners like Local IQ. Um, I also created a digital marketing and e-com certificate, which actually just went live. So if you look at my LinkedIn, it's on there. Um, for Google and Coursera, prior to this, I was an account executive at Aon on Wall Street. I'm currently based in Los Angeles, and as a fun fact, um, I actually also went to culinary school, so I'm a chef as well. Super cool. We have super interesting speakers on here today. I'm really excited for that. So just to bring us back to what we'll be covering today with this webinar, again, thank you, Jenna and Erin, for joining us. I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say. Um, we're going to kick things off with Erin. We're going to talk about just understanding the general consumer purchase journey. Um, across Google and the marketing space so far. We're gonna do a quick recap of some trends. We'll hop into some of the fundamentals that you'll want to keep in mind for your business as you finish out the year. And then we'll switch gears over into um, some insights from Jenna over at Google, the future of Google search and how to apply what you've taken in at this webinar today to your business for the rest of 2022. So I love to get everyone warmed up and keep people on their toes. So I want you guys to type in just a quick little pop quiz, your answer to this question here. You know, what do you do? Let's say you have no idea how to reach a business or how to get information about something. Where do you go? Do you call a friend? Do you open up the phone book? Or are you searching online? Which I think the reality of a lot of us have done. So let's see some of the answers here. Um, Courtney says she's gonna Google it. A lot of folks are saying Google it. Kim saying Google it. Bez saying Google it, Darcy's just surfing the web, maybe trying a couple different platforms. Tons of people saying Google it. Oh, Shannon said, ask someone in the office. <laughs> I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, let's see, tons of folks saying that they just hop online. Someone said, ask their mom. To all the moms out there, thank you for all, answering all our stupid questions. But the majority of us, it looks like, are online. They're searching online, whether it starts with a regular search, maybe you go on social platforms. Some of those folks are saying maybe you ask a friend. But at the end of the day, at some point, you're trying to gather that information online. And I want you to keep in mind that in mind as we go through this content today. So with that, I'll hand it off to Erin. Thanks, yeah, and just jump forward one more slide for me. Um, and so uh, there wasn't a super hard pop quiz question, I guess, for everybody, right? But um, we know that 93% of online experiences begin with a search. And so when people are seeking information, it all starts with search. And I wanted to, to unpack that just a little bit as we get started, because um, I think probably a lot of us are the right age on the call that you didn't we remember what it was like before Google when you had a question, a question that you didn't have an answer to and like you just you called somebody or you didn't know or you had to like you know god forbid actually like drive to the library to find information we know that everything from a customer journey point of view when you're seeking information starts with search and one of the maybe more sort of uh striking a heart cord pieces of information that we found from research is that google is the first place people go for everything so if somebody goes to the doctor and gets a serious diagnosis they get diagnosed with cancer with anything you would think that the first thing that they would do is call a loved one but they don't. In the parking lot after the meeting, the very first thing that they do is they go to Google seeking information. And uh, we know that that's not just something emotional like healthcare, that's for basically every industry. The very, very first thing that we do in all uh, areas of our life is that we go to Google. And we also know that um, generally the consumer buying journey both starts and ends with search. 
right? Like people bounce around between a lot of different channels, but we know that that's the case. So when we talk so much about search, that's the reason why is because it's such a cornerstone of so many things in our lives right now. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump forward. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what's trending. And I think Susie's got a couple of different questions that we're gonna lead through and have a quick discussion on some subjects. So what have we got, Susie? For sure. So that is a super interesting stat that you pulled there. Of course, it all does start with a search, but how is that search space changing? We're in the middle of 2022. Um, and I just want to, I'm curious myself to hear your thoughts, Erin, on some of the trends this that we've seen so far this year. So for example, I'm dying to know. I've heard that YouTube is on the rise. However, I've heard that for a while now. And as we're getting towards the end of 2022 and the second half of the year, I want to know, do you think it's going to maybe fall in popularity? Is it going to continue to rise? What's the deal with that? Sure. So YouTube's definitely on the rise. And uh, the first thing I want to call out is that um, the reason, one of the reasons that we talk about YouTube is that it's the second largest search engine. So um, if you can't really have a conversation about search without talking about YouTube also. So like that's the first thing to sort of uh, keep in your mind. The other thing that I would call out for everybody is that um, we have a tendency to have anchor points. Meaning whenever you first hear about a technology, like you sort of have an idea about what it is, right? And so for example, like TikTok, you're gonna have a concept of what TikTok is. And as that platform evolves over the next however many years, it's gonna be hard for you to change your mind. A lot of people remember YouTube as the funny cat video platform and you have not updated your viewpoint on it. I want you to know that YouTube is not the funny cat video platform. It has evolved radically. You're talking about a platform that's getting the equivalent of five Super Bowls of attention every single day. It's billions of users. It's uh, it's on all of the, the different platforms. And one of the things that's important to call it from a, specifically from a marketing point of view is that I think it is a blue ocean of opportunity. And let me give you just a couple of pieces of what I mean by that. Um, if you think about like what you're paying for cost per clicks right now on search versus what you're paying for a cost per completed view on YouTube, YouTube it's like five cents. 10 cents for a completed view with incredible targeting, right? And we can get into that one of these days about all the in-market audiences and everything that's available. So not only is it on the rise, um, but it's also a miss probably for a lot of your competitors. Like a lot of your competitors are not doing a good job of advertising effectively in that space. And you can do it from a very uh, sort of price competitive point of view. So yeah, absolutely on the rise. And it's an area where you can get ahead of your competition. Right. That was a super solid answer. Thank you, Aaron. I mean, I love how you called out how you can get ahead of your competitors by being on that because it is a hot new trend and a lot of folks haven't maybe updated or really dug into their targeting there. So that's really great insight for all of us here today. I know that for sure. Now, the other thing that's just a little bit different, I want to switch gears here, is I've heard a lot about voice search over the last few years. So it was home assistant devices, personal devices, whether it be, you know, just the Google Home or any any product like that. I want to know, do you, I know that those came out like in the past few years and they started kind of changing the SERP, but has that changed? Do you think those will continue to be on the rise? Should there be a strategy shift to include those types of searches in your um, campaigns? Sure. So voice search is really interesting, right? Because when it came out, uh, the stats on how radically voice search was changing, um, I think the anticipation was is it was going to completely revolutionize everything. And the, the stats in terms of how much voice search is getting used are big. But what's interesting to think about is how are people using voice search? right? Um, what percentage of those voice searches are really for queries for businesses? So a huge chunk of voice search is people setting alarms and setting timers and asking for music to be played and asking for directions to places. So think about does your business fit within that niche? What's interesting to think about though is how voice search and how voice related products are integrating into our lives. And I'll give you an example from my life. I decided that I wanted automated lights in my house. It was time. I wanted to be able to, to tell Google to turn off my lights. I bought the bulbs and everything for it and it is amazing. And I needed to get the, the Nest like mesh network in order to make all of that happen. And what's interesting is you find that um, it creates gravity points and the culture in your household actually shifts around this device. 
Um, one of the most interesting things we discovered is that Google has an animal of the day. If you have not tried this, Google and ask Google what the animal of the day is, and you can hear about the, the ocelot and hear the ocelot sound and all of the facts. Um, but that's not, even though that's culturally changed a lot of things, that's not a business strategy impacting thing. So I want you to take a look at your business and think about, is my business something that somebody would use voice search for? So maybe you're, um, like if you have an emergency and it's like, hey, I need to call a locksmith, maybe that's somebody something would do a voice search for, but if you're a very complex medical device, that's not something that I'm researching through voice. Try to pick two extreme examples just to sort of get your head around it. So it really is vertical specific on how it is uh, impacting everything, but certainly as time goes on, it's gonna become more and more ubiquitous, more and more integrated into our lives because voice is just gonna be something that's on for all of our different watches and phones and smartphones and everything. I'm definitely going to ask Google Home the animal of the day going forward, but that was super great insight. And I love that you compared industries there because it sounds like it is industry specific and that will impact a lot of folks strategy towards the end of the year. Like is targeting for voice search really applicable to me? So I think that was a great example there. Thank you for that, Erin. Um, and then the last question I have now, this kind of impacts the last couple of questions that we talked about where we're kind of changing our strategy to match the trends, right? Maybe we're doing some more YouTube, maybe we decide that voice search um, strategies have been effective for my industry. So do I apply that to SEO? Do I only do it for PPC? Should I be doing SEO and PPC together? Like do those two strategies work together you think towards the end of the year or you think they, you can really do one without the other? What do you think? Sure. So. Um... You, you certainly need to be doing both. And the reason that you need to do both is that Google is the most, it's the sort of the best real estate in the world, right? Like we talked about in the beginning, our pop quiz question was, what's the first thing you do whenever you want an answer to something you search? Where do you go when you search? You go to Google, you get to the uh, search results page. Um, that's made up largely of two things. There's paid components, that's the PPC piece. And then there's organic components, that's the SEO piece. So the best thing that you can do for your business is have what we call page dominance. And what we mean by that is, is that you wanna show up on all the places. So if I search for best air conditioning company in Dallas, that's where I'm located. And I did this recently because I tried to smart home wire my uh, thermostat and I screwed it up royally <laughs> and I needed somebody to come in and do it. And a lot of things happened for that. Uh, I picked the company because that I, I think it was Baker Brothers is who I picked, but they were in the search ads. They were the number one thing. They were in the map stack. And then in the SEO rankings, they were like number two. They were in all of the places. Humans are always looking for shortcuts, right? And whenever you see that, there is a credibility that comes from having that sort of underlying stamp of approval of being all of, in all of those places. Um, but it's difficult. They're very, very difficult disciplines to execute well on. Right. So SEO is a long term thing. Um, I think somebody is asking, uh, let's clarify what SEO and PPC are. OK, cool. Just wanted to make sure somebody answered that. Yeah. So SEO is the, the organic listings. It's stuff that you're not paying to get through. Um, you don't get there by accident. There's a lot of technical details that you need to get right on your site and uh, factors in order to, to nail SEO. PPC can be like turning on the water faucet. Um, you can pay in order to get those listings, but they're very different disciplines. Generally, we find that you need completely different teams in order to execute effectively on that. You don't generally have somebody who runs both together because they're such different disciplines. So um, are they friends? Friends, yes, but they're they're different languages. Like they relate, but they are very, very different disciplines, and it's important to look at both of them. I think that was a great answer. Thank you, Erin. That really explains a lot. I love the concept of that page dominance where you want to be covering your bases, right? Making sure that you show up in those organic results, those free results that you want to, of course, automatically get, but also still have those paid results and have dominance there as well. Um, so that was great. Awesome conversation, Erin. Thank you for that. Now, I know we want to move on to your next section into the fundamentals. So let's jump into that. Yep. So we're going to talk about uh, getting ahead of the curve. I think a lot of times when we do this, um, people will focus on the, the shiny object, like what's new and what's hot in the industry. And that, that's important. But what we find over and over and over in working with thousands of businesses is just getting the fundamentals right and coming back to that is uh, really where the most ground is covered. And so I'm going to go through some pieces on that. So on the next slide, 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about inflation. Now, you probably know what inflation is, but I just want to do this slide to lay the groundwork, right? So inflation is just that the your purchasing power is being reduced because the price of goods is going up. Like that's the, the baseline for inflation. It's something that's happening in everything right now. So cost of gas has gone up, cost of food is going up, cost of everything is going up. Nobody is really happy about that, especially in a business sense. So on the next slide, you can see what like the history of gas has done over time. For some of us, you can think back about high school of maybe what you paid. I think I paid like 60 or 70 cents maybe for a gallon of gas in high school, but this is just from 2000 to 2020. And you can see it's fluctuations over time. Now, the, the conclusion that I want you to sort of get from this on the next slide is I want you to think about um, how you have to respond to the price of gas, right? So um, as the price of gas goes up, you have to, to deal with that one of two ways. Right? Either you have to decide that you're going to drive less because you only have so much money for gas, or you have to increase the budget that you're going to spend on gas, and there's only so much pie, so then you're probably having to take that money from somewhere else. You're having to spend less on entertainment. But you have to deal with that one way or the other. And then I want you to just stick with me on this. If you, if you didn't, if you decided, hey, I'm not going to react to the price of gas, like my budget is, is 20 bucks, and you didn't up that, then you're just simply not gonna go as far as you did before. Like if you just decided to ignore that inflation happened and you were just putting the same amount of money in your tank, there were gonna be consequences for doing that. Uh, I picked gas because it's such a tangible example, but what we find is, is that inflation happens in other areas and people don't necessarily tend to that. And that's what I wanna talk about next. So um, this is what cost per click changes have been over time. So it's either from inflation, it's just from competition, it's from all sorts of reasons. But what we looked at was from 2006 to 2016, how did the average cost per click change? In 2006, the average cost per click was 32 cents. I think a lot of us that are running campaigns, if you were getting 32 cent cost per click, you would be thrilled to death. In uh, 2014, the average was up to about uh, $2, $2.14. $2 I didn't run it out further than that because what we saw after that is that it fractured hard into different verticals and at some point just talking about the overall average isn't necessarily as helpful like if you are a lawyer you might be paying $50 a click and be happy that you're getting $50 a click because of how competitive that space is um, there's other industries where maybe you're still getting sub dollar sub $1 uh, cost per clicks it's a sort of fraction from that but the graph is just showing hey the cost per click has went up over time there has been um, click inflation associated with that so just jump to the next slide for me. So the reason that I talked about inflation in the beginning is to introduce this term is click inflation, right? Everybody's heard inflation before, but you may not have heard this term before, but I think as soon as you hear the two words strung together, uh, you immediately understand, right? That the, the cost of advertising has gone up. What we find is, is that uh, people do not adjust their budgets over time. Like they will, they'll establish their initial marketing budget of $1,000, $5,000, $50,000, whatever that is for their search campaign. And they set that and then years go by and they never adjust it. Now you didn't do that with gas, right? Like you, you had to update your budget. If it took you 50 bucks to fill up your tank and now it costs you $80 to fill up your tank to get the same distance, you did that. But what we find in advertising is, is that people set their budgets and they don't. And it's because click inflation, it doesn't sort of necessarily hit you the same way. Like people don't make the same decision. Um, but you have to react to what the market is doing because the market is going to move and make changes that are going to impact you whether you choose to or not. So that's our new vocabulary for, for the day is uh, click inflation. And then the, the connecting concept to click inflation on the next slide is impression share. So Click inflation is something that happens to you. Impression share is the, the mark, market overall. Okay, so here's the definition of impression share. If you've not heard this term before, it's the percentage of impressions that your ads receive compared to the total number of impressions your ads could get. So impression share is what percent of the pie are you getting? So again, think back our pop quiz question. You're gonna go to Google, you're gonna search for a thing. Whenever you hit enter to search, 
a lot happens technologically on the back end of Google, right? There is an auction. There are a lot of people that are all like, oh my goodness, I want to show up in the paid ads first, right? You know, like a bunch of people all want to be in that spot and an, a, an, an instantaneous microsecond auction occurs and there are winners and losers from there. Sometimes you get to be shown, sometimes you don't get to be shown. And there's a lot of reasons why that is, but your impression share is the percentage of times that you're showing up and you wanna make sure that you're showing up enough. So um, this is what impression share actually looks like. I find that most people are sort of visual learners. This is kind of what that looks like. There's the, the market segment. That's the, the sort of vertical that you're in, that there's a cluster of searches that are happening on, right? So again, if we're talking about HVAC, there's a whole bunch of search terms related to HVAC. That's the market segment. Then there's eligible traffic that you could potentially show up for. So within your search campaign, you've picked a group of keywords, you've picked a certain targeting, you've picked like, this is the area that I want to be in. That's all the available eligible traffic. And then the impression share is your slice of the pie um, of that traffic. And so what I just want you to think about, right, is, is understanding what is your impression share. Um, on the next slide, I'll show you uh, the, I guess the less prettier visual example is that I want you to know that if you're like, hey, where do I find this? There are specific columns within your Google Ads account if you're running these yourself that you can find out what your specific impression share is by keyword, by, um, by ad group, by all of those things. This data is available to you. So um, these columns generally aren't turned on on their own. You're gonna have to go in and customize to turn those on, but you, you need to know what that number is. But then we get to the, the next question, which is what should your impression share be? Uh, I'm gonna try to actually give you a tangible number for this because I know that the truth is, is it depends, right? It depends on your goals. It depends on, let me go back one. Um, it depends on uh, your goals, what you're ultimately hoping to accomplish. I think if I'm gonna sort of plant my flag in the ground, at minimum, your impression share should probably be 40% should probably be in the 40 to 70% range for impression share. Uh, you don't wanna have 100% impression share. Some people make that mistake and they're like, I wanna be 100%, like you'll end up overpaying if you're trying to claim the entire pie and show up for every single thing. Um, but if your impression share is 10%, when you look at that, it's like you are under budgeted. And if you haven't uh, adjusted that, like it's, it's time to take a look at that. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at, at budgeting, right? So once you know what your impression share is, let's say that you look it up and you're like, okay, my impression share is 15%. And the <laughs> the nice lady on the webinar said that it needs to be in the call it, you know, 40% or more range, then you need to think about how are you going to combat click inflation and how are you going to secure your impression share and how do you need to make that budget adjustment, right? And you're probably gonna to wanna to do that incrementally. We recommend, we don't ever recommend, even if somebody is at 10% and we wanna get them to 50%, we don't generally recommend that you just step on the gas and you know quadruple your budget. You need to do that smartly. You need to do probably 20% to 30% increases of your budget over time to, to sort of move that up and sort of test and make sure that all of the performance metrics are where you want them to be. But you need to think about where that money is going to come from right? So if you're thinking about what is your traditional media look like versus your digital advertising, really what's the ROI that you're getting from that? Um, of course, we're huge fans of digital advertising. We think it's more measurable, more effective, and less expensive. You should take a look at that. Um, think about uh, the technology that you're using to get spend efficiency, and then think about what your cost centers are, right? Like, are you managing things in-house? Are you outsourcing those things? Uh, there's pros and cons to all of those different decisions, but in the same way that you have to figure out where the money from gas is going to come from, you have to figure out where the money for your search marketing is going to come from. If you agree with the conclusion that search is the very first thing somebody does when they're looking for information and trying to do business, that it's the beginning and the end of the customer journey, and that Google is the most important real estate that you can be a part of and that you want page dominance and that cost per clicks have gone up and that click, click inflation is a real problem and you wanna have a certain impression share, that's something that you have to deal with. And if you don't, it will just continue to shrink and your competitors will be reacting while you're not and that'll be a problem. So it's something that you need to deal with. Uh, the next uh, couple of slides, I just wanna talk about what our technological solution does whenever sort of people outsource their spend to us. Um, 
we have a, a platform that we've been iterating since 2006. And there's a lot of fun terms that are on the slide, right? We use conversion-based optimization, we have a reach maximization algorithm, and we have really smart people that all work together on this. And I find when I, sh when I showed this slide, I wanted something that was a little bit more tangible to explain how our technology works. So I invented this next slide as opposed to using a bunch of buzzwords because I wanted to make the, the technology a little bit more tangible in terms of what local IQ offers. So on the, the next slide, Susie, um, I have the, the cute sort of robot like human hand and, and uh, hand together. So we have a unique offering in the space in terms of trying to get the most efficient spend of your media dollars, right? You want to make sure that you have the lowest possible cost per click so that you can have and the lowest possible cost per click with the, the absolute best ultimate results so that you can have the, the, the most effective spend of your budget. There's two components to that. On one side, there's the there's the robot part of it. I love when they call the robot. That's the technology side that I said that we've been iterating since 2006. Um, it does a ton of technical things. It does things that a human can't do. And then on the other side, we have uh, what, who we call CSMs. Those are client success managers. These are experts in the field, and they do all of the things that only a human can do. There are some solutions out in the marketplace that are purely technological, and there are some solutions that are you know, purely human. We think that you want to have the best of both worlds. You want to have technological pieces that do all of the things that only a robot can do, and then you want to have humans watching over that because every bad sci-fi movie you've ever seen is where you let the robot run off on its own. What you're looking at on the bottom is the difference between a purely human solution a hand managed campaigns versus how local iq tech works so if you have a uh, somebody super smart right and you sort of strap them to the desk and you say all right bob like get after it and make my campaign really good how many changes is that person really going to make maybe they're going to make 300 changes over a period of time our platform is going to make thousands and thousands and thousands of changes and it's going to do that at a granular level and it's just something that a human can't do it's going to go in at each individual keyword level for each individual geographic region and it's going to up bid or down by by certain percentages and it's going to understand exactly where uh, it wants you to show and so what i want you to take away from this right if you're looking for a solution to have a more effective spend of your media dollars um, you should take a look at the local IQ platform because it's a unique offering in the space that gives you the best on the tech side, but also the best on the people side. Um, and we're happy to sort of unpack what the results look like in your specific vertical versus to what we're getting now. So uh, that's the end of the only salesy part I promise that you're going to get from the, this whole thing. I am going to turn it over to uh, Jenna, who is amazing. I'm super excited to get to hear about everything that she has to say, and she's going to run us through the future of Google search. So Jenna, take it away. Thanks, Erin. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jenna Zidane, and it's a pleasure to be here again to talk about the future of Google Search. As I mentioned before, I'm an agency development manager here at Google, uh, where I basically work and partner with um, some of our agencies to help them grow and scale their clients, and that's the partnership I have with Local IQ. Uh, Google is now 23 years old uh, in human years. This is a time of real incredible change and opportunity, um, and Google is no different. So just over the past few years, over 500 million people started using Connect devices for the first time. And in that time, we've really introduced a completely new way to search. Um, if we go to the next slide, before we get into the content, I'm just gonna quickly highlight, uh, we revamped our Premier Partner Program for some of our partners and agencies. Um, to make it much more exclusive, where now it's only the top 3% of partners. I'm really excited to announce that Local IQ is a part of that top 3%. It means that they get access to kind of the premier partner um, portion on the right-hand side. Um, this includes education and insights from our teams to enhance their product knowledge and make sure they stay on top of industry trends that they can share with you, access and support for um, Google ad support and policy. Um, I know that that's an issue for a lot of clients. and then recognition and, award, and rewards along with some of those promotional offers. So before we get into things, I just want to highlight that um, new partnership. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, um, we'll get back into the content. So do you remember when Google looked like this? Um, this is 1998 and Google was only a search engine and only about 4% of the world had access to the internet at this point. And then if you fast forward to today, um, 
Next slide. Almost 60% of the world has access to the web, where 92% of these access via mobile devices. That little computer corner that you used to have in your home is now a supercomputer in your pocket. It's been 15 years since the smartphone came out, which is so hard to believe, um, but it really sparked a revolution in the way that we behave and mobile has changed everything. So users are searching more than ever and their needs continue to evolve. Today, we all have smartphones in our pockets and smart TVs in our living rooms um, and our computers on our wrists and in our cars. To give you some perspective, there are 8 billion connected devices around the world in 2017. That's more devices than there are people. But last year, that figure was close to 27 billion. That is growing by a million new devices every single hour. And then, so why is this important to you as an advertiser? Um, the reason is that this growth in connectivity is having a dramatic impact on how we behave as consumers and how we really interact with brands. So if we look, for example, um, every single day, 15% of searches made um, on Google is something that Google hasn't seen before. So can you imagine how many new searches that is? Aaron touched on it a bit even on YouTube, but if you think about how many times you turn to Google for information a day, um, Google gets billions of searches every single day. And of those billions of searches, like 15% are new every single day. So as the world has changed dramatically since 2020, it's no surprise that consumer behaviors have as well. We're all turning to search even more for our daily needs. We wanna get ideas of where to go, what to buy. We wanna support local businesses and find new ways to be smart with our money. We're now not only using search to get information anymore, but it's being used for exploration as well. So how are you ensuring that you're showing up while people are exploring versus just searching? Um, the consumer journey is more unpredictable where people are discovering, researching, and considering brands. So now that life has gone even more virtually, I'm sure we've all gone down a hole where we're sitting on our phones on the couch researching 10 different uh, brands for a new product we want to buy. I just bought a house, so maybe it's a couch or even a mop for the home. Um, you would typically would have gone to look at that in person and maybe just purchase something that you saw in stores. But with shopping, we might have been limited to two brands. But now with the internet and the pandemic, we have every brand at our fingertips online. So it's no surprise that 75% of consumers are really trying different brands and websites. This is also true for finding services. So maybe a dog groomer or a plumber. We used to just maybe ask around, go, um, go to a place we saw maybe in the neighborhood, but now we're sitting and looking at five different options. We're reading reviews, comparing before we even make a decision. So this change will have a huge impact and already has on our post-pandemic marketing strategies. And we see CM CMOs in our industry agreeing. So now that we know that one, consumer journeys are getting more complicated and fast, two, that e-commerce has grown more in 2020 than it has in the past decade with no plan for consumer change, um, three, that YouTube and on-demand video has skyrocketed with over a billion hours of video watched every single day. It's vital for brands and companies to embrace what we call the digital transformation here at Google across their organization. So how can you do this and what does this even really mean? Data and automation that uses data and signals in real time at scale. This allows brands to capture demand and drive growth. And we see a 15% in, increase in purchase intent for brands that do this. To do this, you really need to be privacy first. Uh, next slide. Privacy first, data driven, and to use automation to meet demand in real time. Google can really help you do this, and I'm going to go a little bit more into detail on what this actually means. So this is done through measurement and automation. So without going too into the weeds, when I say privacy first measurement, we're talking about things like utilizing your first party data, conversion modeling, and privacy preserving technologies. Uh, Google's automation and machine learning only works as well as the data you feed it, and this becomes even more important as we talk about cookie lists this year. 
Um, an example of conversion modeling is the new enhanced conversion beta, which Local IQ has access to since they are a premier partner for their clients. Um, and some of examples of the first party data is importing your offline data from a CRM back into Google. This is something we see that's super vital for lead gen businesses because they think about lead quality and ensuring that we're utilizing the data they have. Or what about importing a list? So of past purchasers or people who may have added your product to cart for e-commerce businesses, and then using that data to then target those users again, or even allowing Google's automation to use the data to find people that might have somewhat of a similar profile. So your first party data is extremely powerful and you can propel your success on Google utilizing it, especially as we go cookie list. So I know for me, um, I've looked at like a pair of sneakers and then start to see ads for them all over the site, all over when I'm searching or on different sites. And I, of course, end up purchasing. I know this means that this brand has a really strong marketing strategy and is using their first party data. So in a little further in this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about the automation piece of things. Um, but first, before that, um, if we go to the next slide, BCG actually just launched research that touches into the exact topic with measurement specifically for lead generation businesses. What they say in the study is quite simple. One, businesses are successful in integrating customer data to their advertising strategies become 30% more efficient in customer acquisition costs versus businesses that aren't. And two, these same businesses that were able to integrate this data with marketing strategies also drove 20% incremental revenue versus businesses that don't. So this means that advertisers need to be using their first party data to help improve their effectiveness. The more data available to our machine learning, the more effective your efforts become. Uh, and then for e-com, if we go to the next slide, uh, it will hit 1 trillion this year, which means even more digital ad spend. So to give you some context, in 2020, uh, it will nearly will nearly 2x, or sorry, 2022 this year, will nearly 2x its pre-pandemic level of 2019, and will add another 550 billion by 2025. So the pandemic alone boosted online shopping by 183 billion over the past year, and has permanently accelerated e-commerce with Americans on track to spend that one trillion online, which is a record amount uh, in 2022, according to this new report we have from Adobe. In the first two months of this year, consumers have already spent 121 billion online. This is up 34% from the same period last year, according to the index, which uses Adobe Analytics to study the data covering over 1 trillion visits to US retail websites. And remember when I mentioned uh, that people are discovering, researching, and considering brands more than ever? Well, Google is the most used website for product research, even more than Amazon by a whopping 48% on mobile, where most are searching. But also we're even up on some of these other areas, laptop, TV, game consoles. But that mobile shift is dramatic as we're seeing that most people are searching on mobile. And then we're gonna get into the changing search ecosystem um, on the next slide. Uh, I wanna take a step back and really think about how users search on Google. So these searches are fueled by a variety of individual contexts and needs. When people search, a lot of contextual signals get passed along. So such as time of day of their search, their location, the device they're on, all of these signals come together and make each search unique. So to reach each user with the right message at the right time, you wanna be sure you understand and target these signals as best as possible. This creates more complexity in account management and some of these signals cannot be optimized for manually, which is something that Aaron was touching on as well. So this is why something like automated targeting is the best solution to effectively and efficiently account for and optimize against all available signals in order to reach your performance goals as a company. Search advertising has changed in large part thanks to machine learning. Over the years, we've incorporated more and more machine learning or automation into our products. And this is also, again, to touch on the fact that as we go cookie list, a lot of this automation will be required. Um, on the slide, you can see some examples of our automation solutions I mentioned earlier um, that I would touch on. For example, responsive search ads, which we'll discuss in detail on the next slide, or dynamic search ads. Um, 
which are based on the URL you input of your site, where Google will then crawl your website's landing page and create an ad based on what the user is searching to ensure whichever product you have that's a fit for them on your website is shown to them in the ad based on whatever query they searched. So like we talked about, um, the ways people search are constantly changing in order to capture this growth. Uh, businesses, next slide. Yeah, businesses need to invest in the right data and automated solutions. So starting in June, we're actually sunsetting extended text ads, meaning that advertisers will no longer be able to create or edit extended text ads. And the only search ad type that will be available moving forward is responsive search ads. So what are responsive search ads and really what makes them so great? Next slide. So responsive search ads offer true query time optimization. So I'm sure you're wondering what that even means because even as I read that. Um, so you as an advertiser will provide your assets or multiple ad text ads. Um, and then our system assembles these groups into assets. Um, I mean, assembles these assets into ad groups, and then those are predicted to perform better based on each individual user's search. So let me give you an example. Let's say you own a plumbing business and you advertise on Google. If one person searches plumber near me and another person searches plumber for clogged toilet near me, these two people may see different ads for your business that are relevant to their search. So let's say for plumbing near me, they may see an ad that says something like 24 seven, same day plumbing service. And for the person searching plumber for clogged toilet near me, they may see an ad set that says something like 24 seven toilet and drain service, but it's still your same company. So each of these people are searching, each of the people searching are more likely to click your ad since it's relevant for their search, specific search. So this is only possible for responsive search ads. So we wanna make the ads as applicable to the person's search as possible because we know that they're more likely to engage and click the ad. So this means that responsive search ads actually uh, evaluate tens of thousands of potential ads in a fraction of a second to show more relevant message for each person based, of their, based on their con context and intent signals. So this change helps you as a business to basically simplify the way you create ads and drive performance to ensure you're showing the most relevant ad based on what they're searching for. And we see that advertisers that switch from expanded text ads to responsive search ads using the same exact assets see an average of 7% more conversions at a similar cost for conversion. Because like I mentioned before, they're able to the ads are able to be more relevant. So with us learn with with us learning uh, leaning more into automation, we have also included improvements in our overall control and transparency launches. So we're moving to show uh, queries instead of keywords as a signal. So that means instead of just optimizing towards a keyword like handbag, if someone searches for something like sleek, black, classy handbag, we are looking at the entire query. And now, even though our ads are more automated, you can now review the queries Google is using for your brand. So you can optimize for your website, future ad copy, and more. And since many search, search queries are misspelled, uh, next slide. In 2020, we launched a new algorithm that learns from less common and unique spelling mistakes. So for example, in the slide, you'll see if someone searches average home cost, Google can see their, the user is likely looking for average home cost. So since search query search is query based, it's important that we understand what a user is searching. So then your brand can accurately solve for what they're looking for. So in summary, um, connected devices have gone from 8 billion to 27 billion since 2017 and 15% of searches on Google are new every single day. With these shifts in the pandemic, there's been a dramatic impact on how we behave as consumers and how we interact with brands. The consumer journey has become even more complex and unpredictable where people are turning to search to explore, research, and plan. It's vital for brands to embrace what we call at Google the digital transformation across their organization through privacy-first measurement and automation. This is even more true um, for both e-com and lead gen, but where e-com clients are expecting to hit 1.1 trillion in 2022. 
which will nearly 2x its pre-pandemic level in 2019. And for lead gen customers, we have to think about the fact that um, the first party data becomes even more relevant as we go cookie-less. Um, Google is the most used website for product research. Um, and if we go to the next slide, as fantastic as Google tools may be, you know your customers better than anyone and have the opportunity to engage with them and delight them in more meaningful ways than ever before. So how are you working with local IQ to ensure your brand is prepared? I believe I'm gonna pass it back to, thank you so much. I believe I'm gonna pass it back to Susie or Aaron. I'm gonna hand off these final thoughts to Aaron to just round it out and then we'll switch gears into our Q and A in just a few minutes. So Aaron, sure. I'll, let it, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, so um, thanks everybody for taking uh, time out of your day in order to, to absorb all of that. What we know in all of our research from doing these presentations and doing all sorts of training for our clients is that your retention of that information is gonna be far lower than you would think that it's going to be. Most people think that they're gonna retain, like, like, yeah, I got it, I took some notes, I'm gonna get the material, it's gonna be great. You're probably going to retain about 10% of what we said today. So like, let that, if you take nothing otherwise, sink that in. But you you decided that this was important enough to take an hour out of your day to sit through, to listen to us all talk. What I wanna make sure is that you get the most value possible out of this. And the way that you do that is you figure out how to apply these concepts to your business specifically. The good news is, is that you don't have to do that yourself. We will do it for you and we will do it for free. Um, other people would probably charge you thousands of dollars of consulting to figure out how all this maps out, but uh, we're happy to do that for you. So some specific things. You're like, hey, Aaron, you talked about impression share and budgeting and what should my budget be? Uh, will you help me figure that out? Like, help me determine what my current impression share is and what my budget should be and if my strategy needs to change and if I need to add new products? Yes. Uh, will you help me map out what the most modern consumer journey is and if I'm going after the right people and how my strategy might need to shift for that? Yes. Um, hey, I'm looking at the last six months of the year and I need to be thinking ahead of time of what my holiday strategy is going to be. Um, can you help me with that? Yes. So whatever your specific use case is, which is a lot of times what people come up to within the, the questions, if you want somebody to slow down and analyze your program, I want you to know that uh, that's that's part of the value of, of working with us, that we'll give the, the data, the insights, the people necessary to give your the program the attention that it needs and to figure out how to apply all of these concepts specifically to you. Um, and it's available to you for free. So definitely uh, take advantage of that and reach out to us and let us know how we can help. Awesome. Thank you both, Aaron and Jenna. This was super helpful. I know I definitely learned a lot and I can agree. If you are here, you most likely are looking to see what more you can get out of your search strategy, whether you're already doing some, maybe already with us and just want to see what else you can do. Maybe you're totally new to this and that's fine too. We're going to put a poll up on the screen and we're going to keep that poll up. And essentially, if you want to see what else you can get out of your search, how local IQ can help you, and you just have general answer questions or questions specific to your business, feel free to hit yes in that poll to get some personalized answers. We have a team of experts that's happy to help you. Um, so yeah, we're going to keep that poll up for the remainder of the webinar while we go through some questions. And Boy, oh boy, were there a ton of questions coming in on this. So Jenna, Aaron, get ready, because there were some really, really great questions for those folks that you know want to get answers, more personalized answers, and hit yes on the poll, but still have answers, feel free to drop them into the Q&A um, and continue to drop those in as we go through. But I am going to start digging through some of these questions here. Um, and I think I'm going to kick it off with a little bit of a bigger question um, here for Jenna, actually, and Erin, of course, feel free to jump in. But a lot of folks were asking if you could maybe break down um, first party data and maybe the, just the general difference between that and third party cookies and, you know, what that might mean for, for advertisers. Yeah, sure. So um, first party data is the data that you hold as a company. So that's going to be the data that you already have. So think about um, maybe your past customers, maybe people that have purchased, or if you're an e-com client, maybe you're tracking people who have added to cart. It is all the data you hold. And it's powerful because as it becomes harder to track 
people from a third party cookie perspective, as we really tighten on privacy and the entire landscape does, it becomes more difficult to rely on that third party data. So we wanna make sure you're leveraging that data that belongs to you, which is that first party portion. And like I said, many clients might have a CRM if they're, maybe they're using Salesforce or HubSpot or something like that, that where they're tracking all this, maybe where they're tracking their qualified leads, their, like I said, their closed ones, or maybe their purchases. We want to make sure you're importing that data back into Google um, and sharing it back. All that data is hashed for privacy purposes. Um, so even for healthcare clients, it's possible or any of those types. Um, you don't need to worry about PII, but um, that's the difference between first party and third party data. Awesome. Great answer. It's super simple. I love the simplified answer because I know that first party data and third party cookies gets tossed around a lot and it can definitely get confusing. So I think that was a pretty simple breakdown. Thank you for that, Jenna. Um, now for both of our experts here, we want to hear from you. Um, how often do you need to update or adjust your keywords to stay relevant um, with these, you know, new responsive search ads and the ever-changing SERP space, should we be adjusting our strategy a little bit more frequently now? What do you guys think? I guess I'll just jump in real quick. The, the first thing I would say is, um, hopefully you have uh, some KPIs in a dashboard that you're looking at that would tell you whether your campaign is going well or not. So like, if you're crushing it and you have high conversion rates and great click-through rates and your cost per clicks are where you want them to be, um, Generally, my advice is like you you let that run and then you think about maximizing performance by additional budget if that's the thing. Um, if if it's not where it needs to be, then then certainly let's start to address that. Uh, the question had a few other components. Sometimes you're identifying maybe there's new technologies you haven't adopted, right? So like whether it's the responsive search ads, maybe you have like a, a version that you're not doing that, then then certainly like that needs to be in your planning process where you're adopting new technology. But uh, I generally go with that if it's not broke, don't fix it. You should be trying to solve for something whenever you're making changes to the, the campaign as opposed to, to changes for changes sakes. I know that that's probably radically simplifying the intent of the question, but those are my initial thoughts. Awesome. That was a great answer. I totally agree. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So if you feel like you're getting what you want out of your Google ads, then you probably don't need to be constantly adjusting your strategy. But as Aaron said, of course, technology is changing. Your audience is constantly changing. Jen approved that with that data. So you might need to make those occasional tweaks here and there. Um, I have some folks on here just with some questions about responsive search ads. Um, now, just to clarify, could Jenna, maybe you could help us out with this. What do you would say like is the average amount of responsive search ads folks should shoot to have, you know, maybe per ad group or per campaign? I know we can definitely do more with less now, right? So would it be two to three, oh. one to two? Yeah, best practice before uh, extended text ads were going away was two responsive search ads to one extended text ad. Now I would say you would just, since ex there's no more extended text ads after this, uh, after next month, it would be the three response, two to three responsive search ads. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, great, thank you for clarifying that. We have a couple other questions coming in. Again, keep those questions coming. I know we're right at time, so we might just round out, um, you know, maybe one last question here. I'll, I'll shoot it back to Aaron. Um, people are asking, when we were talking about SEO and PPC, you kind of did answer this already, but I was just hoping you could reiterate, if they had to prioritize search, organic search SEO or pay-per-click advertising with Google Ads, which one should they do? Is there a right or wrong answer there? I have a feeling you're gonna say, do a little of both, but I just want to hear maybe your thoughts on that before we wrap up. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's complicated. There's a, a lot of different ways that you could do it. If you were twisting my arm and you were like, Aaron, just give us an answer, I would say get search right first. Why? Um, because it's more immediate. So you can, you know, very specifically, you can show up at the top of page of Google. You can get a lot of data back from that very quickly. Um, you can get the, the ROI measured very quickly. The things that you're going to be doing on SEO that you do right now are going to pay off in three months, six months. Like that is a long-term strategy. 
So uh, the thing to get right first is search, it, and it's because you can uh, you can get it done so much quicker, and you can get that right. I'm also a fan of um, sh I call it sort of a shoot one bullet at a time. It's hard to execute on, or maybe the other thing you've heard is chase two rabbits, catch none. Like pick a marketing discipline and decide to get it squared away and solid and execute and then move on to the next thing as opposed to having you know 15 competing initiatives all at the same time so i would get search squared away first awesome solid answer there definitely you know we have those short-term goals and those long-term goals and those can achieve both so a uh, great round up there. This was super informational. Thank you everyone for joining. Again, you'll get the recording, the materials later. Definitely check out our YouTube, our blog to help answer any more questions you have. But again, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Aaron. You guys were awesome. This was really, really great. I know I learned a lot and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everybody.